Have you ever noticed this? And by this, I don't mean the part of the movie where they kiss, I mean everybody else around them. This collective approval is a recognizable trait of movies with a happy ending, yet it manages to remain invisible. For now many seem to question why this happens so much, and this question lives inside an ever-growing Hollywood confusion, and if you wish to join me, we can explore it together. We'll be looking at many films, so there might be spoilers for you. Because my question is, what social embarrassment is hidden behind the persistent Hollywood ending when the protagonist displays their emotions to the public? Or simply, why do they clap? It was James McDowell who took on the task of exploring the happy ending in depth. Throughout the history of American mainstream cinema, he has thoroughly investigated this convention and progressed to determine one of its specific features, the union of the romantic couple. What I wish to add is that perhaps the happy ending might also exist as something inseparably connected to society or morality. In today's trends, I've noticed how it seems necessary for each individual film to assert itself, to be accepted, whereas before there was the social, cultural and historical context that did so automatically. If you look carefully, actions and situations within a film, such as clapping at a couple's reunion, serve as a prejudgment, leaving them with an influenced appreciation of the event. But it wasn't always like this. Back in the day, romance and comedy were separate. The early beginnings of cinema present films such as Girl Shy and Sherlock Jr., both released in the same year of 1924. They presented a balanced dose of comedic gags and romantic development. However, they were still separated narratively. If it were a gag now, then a kiss later. Eventually, it was Harold Lloyd who coined the genre, the moment he wore a pair of horn-rimmed glasses, becoming the boy next door chasing the girl next door. It was a template for what later became known as romantic comedy. And we now know exactly what to expect from a rom-com. As Katharina Glitter says, Everyone knows how Hollywood romantic comedies end with a kiss. And Robin J. Stillwell says, Part of the joy for the audience is knowing that no matter the contrivances of the plot, the couple will end up together at the end. Stillwell goes further and understands the relationship between rom-coms and their viewers with one simple equation, Female spectators are linked to female stars. From this single statement, many of the underlying social traits, from femininity to feministic issues, flow to the surface. The chick flick is the first social embarrassment. Think of it this way, if the genre was born feminine and the world grew into something where it didn't care about femininity or masculinity, something had to change. That's where clapping comes in. Our timeline begins in 1940, where there were no signs of it. With His Girl Friday as example, if we were to fast forward to the end of the film, we would reach its climatic moment. An escaped prisoner practically falls into Hildy's lap. The scoop is so big she can only but begin to write the story, ignoring everyone except for Walter's notes, where they kiss and reunite. Now what I want to point out is how many chances there were for a public display of love, yet that never happens. The film presents one room, at times crowded and at times empty. Notice how the film's acceptance of the love between Hilda and Walter is done by representing intimacy within privacy, something that continues throughout the 40s and even the 50s. In another film starring Cary Grant, An Affair to Remember, the intimate moment of love between Nikki and Terry was still a private one. And just a few moments ago, the house was full of a choir of kids, another moment where there could have been spectatorship, but there wasn't. If we move to the 60s, we begin to see a slight change in Burford in the Park, the intimate and troubled ending between Corey and Paul begins private, but shifts to public when Paul climbs to the top of the roof, threatening to jump. By the time Corey climbs up on the roof to rescue him, an audience is gathered beneath. But once Corey and Paul hug, the first of what will become a very prominent pattern begins. The spectators at the street applaud, and even one of them says, Oh good, they made up. But this phenomenon doesn't pick up until a decade later. The Seventies seem to refute this phenomenon. The social public was very aware and active and were strongly opposed to the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War. This moral certainty manifested itself in film. Perhaps Played Again Sam serves as a perfect example for its ending reference to Casablanca. Made in 1942, the film shows how public spectatorship is not present and why. The conclusion of the film, which ultimately is the separation of Rick and Elsa, is considered happy, albeit being an unhappy moment. This is because from a moral point of view, their sacrifice is a moral triumph. To help Laszlo involves helping the fight against fascism to win the war. In fact, this was a patriotic appreciation for even the Bureau of Motion Pictures report stated, it is shown that the personal desire must be subordinated to the task of defeating fascism. 
they realize that they cannot steal happiness with the rest of the world enslaved. In the 80s, intimate moments shifted from private to public. In Blind Date, the climatic moment takes place at a wedding where friends and family and strangers are there to watch how Nadia stops her own forced wedding with David and publicly acclaims her love for Walter, thus ending with Nadia and Walter jumping into a nearby pool, submerging with a kiss. Everybody claps. At the end of the 90s, the rom-com exploded in quantity, and so did the final speech. More couples would fight in the middle and reunite at the end. It became necessary to end with a, let's call it, inner universe justification, rather than relying on the outer universe, that is us, those watching the film. Never Been Kissed depicts the pinnacle of auto-assertion. Josie writes an apology to Sam in the Chicago Sun-Times. This article acts as a speech, for she states, I think I am in love with you. For all of Chicago to read where she says, I will stand on the pitcher's mound for the five minutes prior to the first pitch. If this man accepts my apology, I ask him to come kiss me for my first real kiss. A double public display of love where a stadium full of people applauds, satisfied with the couple's reunion. The 2000s are no different, maybe perhaps slightly more sophisticated. In Someone Like You, Jane spills her emotions over live TV, leaving only the spectators in the cinema, understanding that she's talking about Eddie. Nonetheless, the audience in the film claps in approval, about a love they don't even know about. In Crazy Stupid Love, there are many love plots, but when a 13-year-old Robbie Weaver makes a depressing speech about love after being heartbroken, his father Cal Weaver steps in and makes an uplifting speech about undying love ending with Robbie shouting into the microphone I still love you Jessica resulting in, of course in a I love you Emily however this phenomenon isn't absolute it only happens when the film possesses some sort of insecurity about the love relationship that is unfolding therefore another way to demonstrate a pattern is to show where it doesn't exist The musical Hair, for example, presents the exact opposite ending to Casablanca, where one of the main love interests doesn't join the military, thus coinciding with their historical context. In When Harry Met Sally, Harry makes a speech for Sally in a New Year's Eve party, but everyone is oblivious, thus maintaining the privacy. Similarly to what Jordan says to Nick about Gatsby's parties. And I like large parties, they're so intimate. Small parties, there isn't any privacy. In Clueless, even with a title that explains how the protagonists are insecure, the intimate decision occurs inside a large, empty mansion. In Ted, the moment where John and Laurie reunite over Ted's dramatic death, the reconciliation happens in a vast and empty football stadium. A stadium that was full of life and never been kissed is empty in Ted. Because the film is content with all the swearing, vulgarity and confusion of the present world, and thus needs no ulterior confirmation of the unusual love that is between John and Laurie. Oh god! Ah, oh, what?! No, oh, this is so gross! Don't tell me, I don't want to hear about it! Oh yeah. my god, no I didn't get it! Another example of a film that is comfortable in their time is In Your Eyes. The retext of the film is that two people are connected mystically and discover that they are able to see through each other's eyes, even though they are 3,104 kilometers apart. These intimate moments between them seem strange for an outsider's perspective, because it looks like Rebecca and Dylan are talking to themselves all the time. But whilst they may seem alone, they're together. This film looks just like an online relationship. As written in The Guardian, it is as if they were a couple perfect for each other, save that they have never met. In the age of the smartphone, the near constant banter Rebecca and Dylan keep up will make perfect sense to a generation weaned on the 24 hour connectivity of texting, sexting, and so on. And so, making sense to a generation, this film doesn't need a forceful appreciation with unnecessary applauding. As a matter of fact, exactly the opposite occurs. As the film reaches the end, both are on the run, chased by authorities. They are literally running away from the public's eye. The reunion happens when they manage to get on a train into a noticeably empty compartment. And finally, to reach a further understanding of the power the inner universe has, let's look at LGBT-themed films, as there aren't many of them inside the romantic comedy genre. One of the first films portraying a same-sex relationship was different from the others. Of course, that film had a tragic ending, with the protagonist shunned by friends and strangers alike. The protagonist commits suicide. 
When his companion discovers this, he attempts to commit suicide as well, but is stopped by a doctor who tells him that he must keep on living and change the world he lives in and bring justice through knowledge. And this was just the beginning of a limited number of films to come. Only recently has there been more acceptance and therefore more films representing the LGBT community. Same-sex rom-coms don't tend to have the applause at the end. Actually, quite the contrary. We find the public appalled. At the end of Beautiful Thing, Jamie and Stee slow dance in public, where some look shocked and some disapproving. At the end of But I'm a Cheerleader, a similar scenario of blind date happens where Megan interrupts Graham's graduation at a conversion camp with a personal cheerleader chant. The public is left speechless. Megan escapes and Graham rushes after her. So the moral choice of, is that love right, no longer refers to us, the audience in the cinema who's watching the film, but also to those inside the film itself, the cinematic world. In other words, the entire world is watching. The engine of the romantic comedy works on love, and on love only, being the drive, the answer, the interest, the moral care, the empathy, the connection, the representation, and the one thing that we can all understand in one form or another. Something so universal can't die. So stories built on this glue have always existed and will continue to exist. What would change is the context the glue is in. The genre was born and linked with an historical context of patriarchy, sexism, homophobia, nationalism. However, throughout time, all those values changed and are still changing. This desire for acceptance seems more and more necessary due to a growing lack or even break of traditions. An inescapable consequence of a globalized world. And this has led to the coexistence of incoherent generations all in one historical context. And inside this complex system, stories needed to be told. And inside a complicated system of capitalism, stories needed to have a bigger production value. So a cinema industry was formed. Essentially, due to three complex factors, traditions, diverse audience, and industry, a simple change could not happen. With an industry tasked to please such diverse audience during times of damaged traditions, uncertainty was the result. And with a diverse audience wanting so many different things, it became hard to create a film where one size fits it all. To understand an unfamiliar love is what films try to do. Only that unfamiliar is no longer found in outer space, but your bordering country. Discovering these forms of love is equivalent to the discovery of America. It was always there. With a global audience filled of individuals familiar with their own form of love, film attempts to unify love again and make love compatible between any individual. Romantic comedies show how we are actually confused about the world we live in, how everything is changing beneath our feet, how we wish to cling to the happy nostalgia of the past knowing the brutality it had simply because we are afraid of the brutality of the present. And when the opposite occurs, that is to say, those films that don't suppress, but rather reflect our flaws, are in turn optimistic about the present, and portray a future in which we may feel comfortable with the new traditions to come. So next time you see a happy ending, ask yourselves, will they clap? Thank you so much for watching the video, this is my first one, I hope you liked it. Uh, there was so much more I could have said about the subject, so if you're interested in any way, you can check out my full dissertation. The link is in the description below. And if you like these kind of videos, tell me, you know, leave a comment below. And a like, you know, if you're already there. And wanna make me happy? <laughs>